To know the planet. To know the universe. To find out what makes things work and why things are the way they are through observation, study, and experimentation. We can unleash the power of the universe and make almost anything happen. This is Understanding Science. Living things have a complex organization. They take in and use energy, grow and develop. Living things reproduce and show variations based on heredity. Living things are also adapted to their environments and ways of life. After years of study, testing, and observation, scientists have come up with these statements to aid in the classification of living things. Hi, I'm Dr. Science. Before we begin classifying living things, we need to review the building blocks of matter. All matter, living or non-living, is made up of elements. Chemists have identified 109 elements, each made up of identical particles or atoms. These elements, in various combinations, form the different kinds of matter. All molecules found in living things are composed of carbon. These atoms and molecules are also found in non-living things. So how do we separate living from non-living? Well, when these atoms and molecules are arranged in a specific order, they allow for life to take place. And this arrangement is the cell, considered to be the basic structure and functional unit of life. The cell is the smallest unit of living material that has all of the characteristics of living things. These cells have given rise to a variety of organisms, from free-living single-cell organisms to massive organisms like the giant redwood and the whale. In the mid-18th century, Swedish scientist Carl von Linn, also known as Linnaeus, developed a system of organizing and naming plants and animals called the binomial system of nomenclature. Bi meaning two, and nomial for naming. This classification gave living things two names. The first name is the genus name, which groups organisms by similarities. The second name is the species which groups the organisms within the genus that are more closely related. The naming and classifying of living organisms is called taxonomy. Later, the classification system was expanded, and today, groupings have become much broader, and they are arranged in a hierarchical system based on similarities. Similar species are grouped into genus, the genera, then placed into families. Similar families are further classified into orders, similar orders into classes, and similar classes into the same phylum, or division for plants. Finally, similar phyla are placed into the largest, most inclusive category, the kingdom. Now, there are five kingdoms in the modern classification system. First, the kingdom Monera, which are unicellular or single-celled microscopic organisms that lack distinct nuclei and other membranes. There are over 2,000 species of monerans, including bacteria and cyanobacteria. These one-celled organisms are essential to life on Earth for breaking down organic matter, recycling soil nutrients, fermenting foods, and in the manufacturing of food by photosynthesis. Bacteria are also used in leather and textile processing and in sewage treatment. Bacteria is necessary for the production of many foods, and it is used to ferment fruits and vegetables into pickles, sauerkraut, and ripe olives. Soil bacteria take nitrogen from the atmosphere and change it into nitrates so plants can absorb them. Without the nitrogen-fixating bacteria, plants wouldn't grow. And without bacteria, dead plants and animal matter wouldn't decay, leaving carbon, nitrogen, phosphorus, and sulfur to waste. Life would stop. The decay of these elements is necessary for the formation of new life, and bacteria is the generator of this recycling process. Viruses are not true cells, and therefore aren't in any of the five kingdoms of living things. 
Viruses are complex packages of genetic material and protein that attack a cell, changing the host cell molecules to meet their own needs. A virus often kills a cell and causes diseases like measles, uh, the common cold, uh, influenza, the mumps. Some bacteria also cause plant and animal diseases, and many have been used by man for the production of medicines. Here we have a dry mount slide of bacteria. Note the lack of structure around the nuclear material. Well, doctors take cultures and examine them in the lab to search for bacteria like Staphylococcus. The structures of bacteria tell the doctor if you have a staph or streptococcus infection. Many diseases like pneumonia, tonsillitis, and strep throat are caused by bacteria and can be transmitted by a sneeze. Other bacterial infections are transmitted through animal bites, direct contact, and wounds. It's hard to imagine but we may not be here if it weren't for these single-celled organisms. The kingdom Munera was first on Earth and probably gave rise to the other kingdoms of plants and animals. Another kingdom of minute organisms is the Protista. Also single-celled, the members of the Protista are diverse in shapes and lifestyles. They can creep, crawl, or don't move at all. They look like bells, eels, fans, snowflakes, stars, and shells. Some protista form close associations with other cells and form colonies. Many others stay unicellular. Protista have formed nuclei, internal membranous organelles, and cytoskeleton. Let's place this protozoan, a euglena, on the slide. Put a slip cover over it and place it under the microscope. After we focus in, we can examine the euglena. It uses the large hair-like flagellum to move around. The large circular structure in the middle is the nucleus. The outer edge is the plasma membrane. We may also be able to identify mitochondria, chloroplasts, and vacuoles on this specimen. A vacuole is a hole. The next specimen is an amoeba. Note its internal structure, the nucleus, plasma membrane, and chloroplast. The amoeba surrounds its food, closing in and forming a vacuole. Then lysosomes move in and release enzymes to digest the prey. Protista are further classified by lifestyle. They're either plant-like, fungus-like, or animal-like. The third kingdom, fungi, are the moles, yeasts, and fungus. Fungi are the great decomposers, different from other organisms because of their unique structure and digestive system. The fungi secrete enzymes into their environment, hmm? where the enzymes digest leaves, fruit, and other organic material. Then, the fungi absorb the nutrients. Fungi are found everywhere and are important in the decomposition of plant and animal wastes. One type is ringworm, which is not a worm at all, but a fungus that gets on your skin and forms a circle. Lichens are a composite organism made up of one species of fungi or one or two species of algae. The species form a close association or symbiosis. These symbionts are generally grown in three different forms. One grows flat and clings tightly to the substrate. Another grows upward or hangs from trees. And the third type looks like leaves with lobed bodies that can be lifted from a rock. In the winter, when food is scarce, lichens are an excellent food source for deer and other plant eaters. The fourth kingdom, plants, are further broken down into aquatic or land plants. The simplest of aquatic plants are algae, although they come in various sizes, shapes, and colors. Algae are also important to the plant world as well as with other life forms. Algae are the oldest plant group and the multicellular blue-green algae gave rise to the first land plants. 
Classified as bryophyta, these primitive vascular plants are similar to each other, but unique to other groups. The bryophyta are small and grow in moist places, since they lack the vascular tissues that carry water and nutrients. Land plants are broken down into non-vascular and vascular plants. Vascular plants include seedless and seed plants. When plants develop efficient internal transport systems and support tissue, they became able to successfully reproduce through spores, which need water to move. The first of these were the seedless vascular plants. The seed plants have been broken down into gymnosperms and angiosperms. Gymnosperms are called naked seeds because the ovules and seeds of these plants are exposed to the environment. Gymnosperms include the tallest, oldest, and most massive plants on Earth. It takes up to two years for these plants to disperse their cone-bearing seeds. Because of their slow reproductive rate, gymnosperms have not been as successful as the angiosperms. Angiosperm means seed container, describing the specialized structure that encloses the ovules and the seed. With that description, what do you think the seed container of an angiosperm is? Hmm? Well, it's the flower. Simply put, angiosperms are flowering plants. And the flower is the key to the angiosperm's reproductive success. Flowers are colorful and have odors and shapes that attract insects, birds, and mammals. Pollen is then unknowingly transferred to other flowers for fertilization. So, while the gymnosperms, with their unprotected naked seeds, reproduce rather slowly, the flowering angiosperms grow and reproduce rapidly. The flower's reproductive organs are easy to see. The petal, the stigma, the sepals, and the ovary is, <laughs> well, the ovary is uh, in there someplace. And the anthers are all these little hair-like things sticking out around in here. Some birds, bees, beetles, and mammals have specialized physical characteristics that help us get nutrients while pollinating the plants. This is another example of a symbiotic relationship where two organisms come to rely on one another for survival. The fruit produced by a plant is another adaptation for the dispersal of seeds. This actually is a mature ovary surrounding the seeds. The seeds disperse by floating on the water and through the wind. They sort of hitchhike on the fur of animals, or even you. Seeds are even eaten and later excreted, possibly to survive as a plant in a place far away from its parent plant. With rapid growth comes a high rate of photosynthesis. So, growing plants need light, water, and a large leaf surface. Plants have had to make some adaptations like in their specialized stems. The main function of the stem is to support and transport water and nutrients. But stems have adapted to a variety of other tasks like serving as storage organs. And yes, the potato is a stem and it's used by the plant for storing starch. Other starch storing stems include onions and garlic. Some stems store carbohydrates for the plants like sugar cane, uh, rhubarb, and broccoli. The thorns of a cactus are usually modified branches and its thick stem is for storing water. For every plant, there are four species of animals. The fifth and last of the kingdoms the animal kingdom 
is broken down into vertebrates and invertebrates. Okay, what makes all animals different from other organisms is their multicellularity. Having a multicelled makeup makes life for animals more complex in ways far beyond that of single-celled organisms. The multicellular animals have grown large and are highly mobile. Animals had developed a stable, controlled internal environment and become able to exist despite a harsh external environment. The first adaptation that animals made was the development of specialized cells. These cells work together to complete a function inside the animal's body, very much like your heart pumping blood while it is still a part of a larger organism. You. <laughs> There is a tremendous diversity among the animals on Earth. We'll start with the invertebrates. As the name implies, invertebrates do not have a vertebra or backbone. The simplest of the invertebrates are the porifera. These aquatic filter feeders are sponges. Sponges have the ability to regenerate. If you took a sponge and put it through a sieve, each piece would grow into an identical sponge. The sponge is a hermaphrodite. It reproduces asexually, like many plants. And it can also reproduce sexually. Sponges also have specialized cells to support them, and that allows them to feed. Animals began to develop bilaterally. They have two sides, like you and I. We each have an arm and a leg, on each side of our main bodies. We are vertebrates. Some of the bilateral animals are invertebrates. The first of the bilateral organisms were the worms. The first of these are the platyhelminthes, or flatworms. Some are quite beautiful, like the marine flatworms with their brilliant markings and fluttering movements. Other flatworms are the planaria, they're rather complex, with eye spots for sensing light and an organ that senses gravity. There are also flukes and tapeworms. The next phylum of worms is the Nenertina, or ribbon worms, classified because of their two-ended gut and blood vessels. Then come the Nematoda, or round worms, characterized by their false body cavity. This cavity cushions the gut with fluids, much like the body cavity of higher animals. The first animals with a true body cavity are the colomates. In the phylum Annelida, we find segmented worms with true body cavities, or columns. But the next phylum is the largest. There are almost a million species of arthropods. All arthropods... have these characteristics. They're segmented and have a hard exoskeleton, which means the skeleton is on the outside. Arthropods have a simple nervous system, antennae, and body is segmented into three sections, the head, thorax, and abdomen. The segmented body gives arthropods some advantages over the worms. Let's take a look at a large arthropod and see if it has the telltale characteristics. This crab is segmented. See the legs? It has a hard exoskeleton, antennae, and three sections, the head, thorax, and abdomen. This crab is an arthropod. In the next phylum, mollusca, we find mostly aquatic animals like snails, slugs, clams, oysters, and squids. Then in the phylum Iconodermata, Animals include sea urchins, sea stars, and sea cucumbers. Other marine phyla include hermacordata and chordata. Now we have progressed to the vertebrates. In relationship to all other life forms on Earth, vertebras are a relatively new adaptation. This structural innovation, the vertebras, allow these animals to move swiftly, 
reproduce more efficiently, and grow to a large size. The vertebrates include jawless fishes, jawed fishes, amphibians, reptiles, and mammals. The mammals, which is what we are, have arrived on Earth the most recent. What makes mammals so unique is that we are all warm-blooded, have hair, and large brain. But what truly distinguishes the mammal from all other animals is the mammary gland, which produces milk for its offspring. You and I are mammals. In the order primate, suborder hominoidae, and family hominidae. Now, I've got a good way to pronounce that. If your mom calls you and says, where are you? You just say, mom, look, don't worry. I'll be home in a day. Hang up. Genus Homo and species Sapien. All other organisms are interdependent with one another. It's one big symbiotic relationship. When you're out in this world, think about the many types of plants there are and birds singing in the bushes, sky and trees. There are insects flitting around and worms crawling through the damp earth. These elaborately constructed organisms, these living things so different from each other, are so dependent upon each other in a very complex manner. And as Charles Darwin once said, all of these living things have been produced by the laws acting around us, the laws of nature. I'm Dr. Science. I'll be seeing you. This program has been a presentation and production of TMW Sales Company. For information on other programs offered by the company, contact the phone numbers on the screen.